No. I'm celebrating it today. Because <laughs> tomorrow's even. <laughs> I was born on the day that Richard Nixon was inaugurated. Oh, Saturday. lovely. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to the Drexel History Lecture Series. And brief announcement for students in the class. The, uh, thank you for participation in the discussion board. And uh, new questions will be populating the board as we go through the term, usually once or twice a week. So please do check back uh, frequently. Thank you again for um, your insights into the weekly uh, presentations and the readings. Another announcement, there is an exhibit, quite fascinating exhibit, called Drexel and the City, which is also part of the 125th anniversary enterprise. Um, this is not one that I created. Uh, and so uh, Lily Milroy, who's the chair of our history, uh, this is really her project. It's a fantastic exhibit now open at the Urban Annex at 3401 Philbert Street. So please make time to go over and check out that, that exhibit. So. It is my pleasure now to introduce you to Chuck Haas, our speaker for today. Chuck is the L.D. Betts Chair and Professor of Environmental Engineering, and he's also the head of the Department of Civil, Civil Architectural and Environmental Engineering here at Drexel. I've known Chuck for over 10 years and have always enjoyed talking with him uh, about issues of science and engineering and water and infrastructure, and he's always kind enough to talk just to the edge of my technical <laughs> comprehension, but never take it too far over. Um, he's a world-renowned engineer and scientist, and his publications run to 20 single-spaced pages uh, in his resume. He's also a very skilled historian. He's pretty humble about it. He wrote one of the chapters um, in our book, Building Drexel, and that will be the substance of his talk here today. So please join me in welcoming Chuck Haas. Chuck. <laughs> Thanks, Scott. Um, well, th this, was a, this was a pleasure and an interesting experience. Uh, skilled historian, I'll have to ruminate on that. Um, this is really the first historical thing I've ever done. And I will confess I did have a slight amount of help. My wife is an ABD his historian, so she sort of uh, clued me into how to structure things properly. Um, so I'm going to uh, talk through some of the things that or in my chapter, but every time I look at this, I discover something else. So there are some things here that go beyond what I included, which was really written uh, a year ago. Um, you know, Scott and Richardson gave me this fancy title. What I really want to talk about is the history of environmental education and research at Drexel uh, from the founding through today. And I'm going to divide it up into these periods, which I think to me make thematic sense based on what occurred both at Drexel as well as in the national context. Um, the founding era through the 1940s, 1950s through 1970s, the 80s through 1997, 1997 to uh, 2002, and then since 2002. So I'll start with the founding era. And what's sort of interesting in a very broad context is for those of you familiar with some big historical themes, the late 19th century into the 20th century is often described as the era of sanitary awakening. And so there was this, this historical thrust of understanding the role that the environment broadly writ had on the health of people. And just to give you a dramatic indication of that, um, there's actually a nice archive of uh, old pictures of the city. And you know we know we've heard this story multiple times, and we heard it from John Fry at his kickoff lecture, that you know, A.J. Drexel and Childs walked from West Philadelphia to, in the case of Drexel, Third and uh, Chestnut every day to his offices at Third and Chestnut. So what did it look like, and what did he encounter? Well, you know, if I didn't have a caption on these figures, particularly the left-hand one, 31st and Market in 1881, you would think I was giving you a picture of a town in the West. You know, it was, it was pretty rural. Even what now is Center City, Market and Juniper, 1892, with the year of the founding, was still, you know, not what it is today, pretty... Um, hither and yon in terms of people and stores and so forth. 
Um, none of the pictures have horses in them, but I'm sure even in 1892, there were a fair amount of horses and horse-drawn omnibuses um, in Center City. And so with horses and with urbanization that occurred, a lot of side effects occurred. And when doing this chapter, I actually, my, I, by way of background, my main disciplinary field is really the intersection between water, people, and human health, especially from infectious disease. And so, lo and behold, I stumbled on this article in New York Times, April 16, 1891, which was six months before the formal founding. There was a waterborne typhoid outbreak in, I didn't get the precise neighborhood, but I think probably what we consider now Germantown, Roxborough, Maniunk, that resulted in 910 cases of typhoid fever and 196 deaths. A story about Philadelphia making in the New York Times. And this, as you go into this editorial, really was one of a series of waterborne outbreaks that occurred in Philadelphia and elsewhere. Philadelphia wasn't unique. Air quality was poor, waterborne quality was poor, and I can't help but think what the nature of the Schuylkill River was every day when A.J. Drexel crossed it. Surely he had to be aware of the fact that it probably was a pretty fetid uh, water body. And did he have anything in his mind relating to improvement of technical education associated with what he observed on his everyday walk? To put this in a broader context, these are typhoid deaths in the city of Philadelphia starting in, oh, the mid-1800s, mid going up to 1942. Prior to the founding of Drexel, typhoid was a frequent occurrence with periodic outbreaks. It started to diminish when the city put in filtration in about 1905, and ultimately when the city put in chlorination of its drinking water in 1912-1913. So that's the background and the context for where we were when Drexel started. As a result, if you look back into some of the early catalogs, Drexel had a Department of Domestic Science, I think probably from the outset. And what did they teach? Well, two courses fascinated me. Domestic sanitation how you manage waste and water in the home. And also, because I happen to be head of the Department of Civil Architectural and Environmental Engineering, domestic architecture, which included such issues as indoor ventilation, and at that point the relationship between get, getting better ventilation and better light was being recognized as one way to reduce transmission of disease. So I would argue almost from the founding, some aspect of concern for environment was ingrained in the origin of Drexel. The more direct evidence I have that, at least if you go into the 20s, it looked something like we know about today is an oral interview by Sam Baxter. Now, Sam Baxter was a part-time student in engineering in the 1920s. He is probably one of the classical part-time Drexel students. He never got his degree but he took courses in what were labeled in the 1920s municipal engineering. Surveying, highway construction, waterworks, sewage treatment, structure, structures and city planning. Sam Baxter started work for the city of Philadelphia in 1923, rose through the ranks to become, in 1940, assistant director of public works first chief engineer of the city in the late 1940s, and first commissioner of the Philadelphia Water Department for a 20-year span from 1952 to 1972. So an illustration of the type of students who were going through Drexel, as well as a fact for the purpose of this talk that municipal engineering, which also in other places had been called public health engineering, was ingrained very early on into this university. What else was happening? The reason why I go into the 40s is the following. 
following the end of World War II, we had a rapid period of industrialization all around the country. With industry comes pollution. And there were massive series of air pollution episodes in the US, in London, and elsewhere, where people died. Denora, Pennsylvania, the right hand photo, October 28, 1948, at noon, because of heavy air pollution emissions from zinc uh, smelters and from coke producers. And the plaque on the right indicates that there were um, 20 deaths and perhaps thousands of people ill. We see this now in Beijing. We see this now in New Delhi. We see this now, in fact, in London. They're in the middle of a massive air pollution episode. It happened here. So both poor sanitation, poor air, had to be on the consciousness of people in that era. And in fact, one of the earliest municipal air pollution programs was set up by the Philadelphia in the 1940s. And so there's a long history both on the water side and the air pollution side in this city of rising to the challenge. Well, what happened to Drexel? So in nine, this, this is the, the earliest faculty member I've been able to trace who worked in the area. So 1954, and the right-hand clipping is from the uh, triangle, Drexel set up the Laboratory of Climatology under the direction of Charles Warren, Warren Thornthwaite. And it was a laboratory in New Jersey. As best as I can tell, it only persisted for about three or four years. Thornthwaite moved on elsewhere. And in fact, my colleague Franco Montalto was here. There's a well-known groundwater model um, that Thornthwaite developed, which Franco and his students use, that's still used today. So air pollution, climatology, meteorology were fields at Drexel certainly into the 50s. At that time, federal legislation started to appear. The first major modern water pollution act was passed in 1956. The first modern air pollution act was passed in 1960. Both of those acts under Eisenhower provided funding to support students to train them to work in the fields of air resources protection, water resources protection. And the Kennedy administration boosted the effort in that area. Now, another key Drexel figure, who's probably, I haven't checked the index. I suspect he's probably in multiple chapters in the book, is Francis K. Davis. So Davis. is probably a paradigm of a number of other Drexel faculty of that era. He graduated in physics from then Westchester T State Teachers College, which we now know as Westchester University. He went into the Army during World War II, served as a meteorologist, got his MS in meteorology at MIT, came to Philadelphia, served as the on-the-air weatherman for WFIL, part-time, got his PhD in meteorology from MIT, from NYU rather, along the way in 1957. He started at Drexel in the 1940s, rose through the ranks. In 63 to 70, he was head of the Department of Physics, and in 70, he became dean of the College of Science. Why is he important to the story? Francis Davis wrote a letter which our archives have in September of 1961, proposing a professorship in environmental engineering. There was already, and I'll talk more about uh, Purdom in a moment, there was already a part-time adjunct faculty member, Walt Purdom, who was teaching at Drexel, who worked for the Division of Air Resources in the city. And as, da as Davis notes to Brothers, who was Dean of Science and Engineering, um, Purdom is the nucleus of a staff which could do research and teaching in areas such as air pollution, water pollution, wastewater treatment and disposal, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. 
Pernum was ultimately hired full time. In 1963, the Institute of Environmental Engineering and Science was founded, which Pernum directed. It was funded in large part by the US Public Health Service under some of the laws and acts that I talked about earlier, and developed and offered MS and PhD programs. At that time, there were very few PhD programs at Drexel. And so the institute attracted a number of faculty to its roster as a means to offer, to advise and offer PhD students and do higher level research in the area of interest um, in environmental science and engineering. By 1969, there were 12 core faculty. Now, the thing to note is even though they were core faculty in the sense that they were devoting their bulk of the effort to the institute, technically they were really faculty in their home departments. So they might have a line in chemistry or they might have a line in um, bioscience, as it was called then, I believe, or in civil engineering or in physics or elsewhere. I don't think there were any humanists, Mark, back in that era, but there may have been. And so essentially, the institute shared faculty with their home departments. And I'll come back to that issue um, later on in the story. This is Walt Purdom. And if there was one person in the story that I would have liked to meet, it was him. Walt Purdom was trained both as an engineer and as a public health practitioner. So he had both a professional engineer's license and a degree in public health, and he served, as I said, in Philadelphia's division on air pollution control. On the way, while he was at Drexel, he was president of the American Public Health Association. You got that, Ian? So, so take that back to the colleagues in the School of Public Health. <clears throat> Prior to 1963, he was part-time. He then became full-time and director of IEES, and served as director until he retired in 1982. And he wrote probably five books on various aspects of environmental science and environmental health. And when I've talked to some of the um, senior faculty who were there at the time, and there are still a couple of faculty now retired from Drexel who are, who are around, um, they say that the books really helped get Drexel on the map in this field. In 1963 to 67, the organization was called the Institute for Environmental Engineering and Science. In 67 to 70, it was called the Center for the Study of the Environment and directly reported to, at that time, the Vice President of Academic Affairs, equivalent now to the Provost. Now, I have two images on the right to serve as a marker to time. The first Earth Day was 1970. First National Earth Day was 1970. And Richard Nixon. Now, broadly writ history gives Nixon um, a lot of reviews for some of the negative things he did. But in the Nixon administration, many of the forefront environmental laws were passed. The EPA was founded over his veto, but it was founded. The Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the Safe Drinking Water Act, the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act, all were Nixon era laws. Imagine that, a Republican passing environmental laws. Think of that in context of tomorrow. In, 19, in 1970, 73, it was cures. In 1973, of uh, the name was changed for another time into the Environmental Studies Institute. Cures actually had a number of other institutes under it, including institutes that focused on city and regional planning and institutes that focused on environmental management. Where were they? The physical location was in the Abbott's building. Now, I think my slides are getting washed out here, but if you look uh, at the bottom to the right, you may recognize that wall from when you walk down Chestnut Street. The wall in front of the Abbott's building is still standing. 
Environmental Studies Institute and its predecessors were housed there up until 1999 and 2000. So I came to Drexel in 1991, and the first eight years, I had an office on the second floor of the Abbott's building. Now, another key name to the story is L.D. Betts. You heard from Scott that I'm the L.D. Betts professor. Leroy Drew Betts was a graduate of the Evening College in 1916, um, I believe with a degree in chemistry. He founded a company called Betts Laboratories, which made a lot of money providing chemicals for water treatment, for standard drinking water treatment, for industrial water treatment, everywhere you have to treat water, boilers and so forth. In his will, he had a bequest to Drexel, which on his death in 1972 was activated for two endowed chairs, one in environmental science, one in environmental engineering. At that time, it was the largest single gift to Drexel. And as far as I know, it was the first set of endowed chairs in the environment at any university in the US. The first two Betts chairs, both of whom I had the honor to know, um, bottom right, uh, Richard Spies, who's my predecessor as the Betts chair of environmental engineering, who's still alive, um, was Betts chair and was at Drexel from 1973 to 1987. He came to Drexel from the University of Illinois Urbana. Wes Pipes, who regrettably is no longer with us, on the upper left was the L.D. Betts Professor of Environmental Science from 1972 to 1982. And Wes's story in and of itself could probably comprise a chapter. Wes came as a faculty member to Drexel from Northwestern. And as the Betts Professor of Environmental Science, his home department was biology. In the process of political machinations, which always occur here in other universities, Wes wound up moving from biology to the College of Engineering, Civil Engineering Department, in 1982. And on doing that, he could no longer be the Betts Chair of Environmental Science. And then he remained on the faculty till his retirement. In the 1980s to 97, I have pictures of two presidents, one of which you know, one of which you may not know. The old time faculty at Drexel know the right hand picture. Ronald Reagan was a major influence because Reagan had a very environmentally unfriendly agenda that put a chill into any problems associated with understanding and responding to threats to human health in the ecosystem. The right-hand figure, any of the students know who the right-hand figure is? Richard Breslin. So Breslin was, I forget what number, Scott. Breslin was president of Drexel. And he was president at the time I came here. And he lasted until 93, 94, I believe. And Breslin was responsible for a lot of the financial challenges that Drexel had, which put the subsequent evolution, not just to the Environmental Studies Institute, but a lot of other programs at Drexel in threat. So Wes Pipe served as the interim director of the Environmental Studies Institute for one year, 1982-1983. After Purdom retired, Wes took over. In 1982, and this is why I sort of feel I was meant to write this, Scott, <clears throat> Herb Allen took over. Herb was recruited from Illinois Institute of Technology. Now, 
I got my bachelor's and master's at IIT. Herb was on my master's thesis committee. And then I came back to the IIT faculty from 1981 to 1990. And for the first two years when I was in the faculty, Herb was at IIT. And then he came to Drexel as director, and he lasted eight years. He's an environmental chemist. He left Drexel to a very large degree, I think, because of Breslin. And he had a very sub successful subsequent career at University of Delaware, and he's now been retired for a while. <clears throat> After Herb left, when I came, Bernard Hamill, who was a professor <coughs> in mechanical engineering, served as interim for a year. From 1991 to 1992, Nick Cernansky, who's still a, a professor in mechanical engineering, served as interim director. And then from 1993 to 2000, Michael Gelt, who's the gentleman on the lower right. Mike was a faculty member in bioscience. And in 2000, he left to become a dean at Indiana University in Calumet, or Purdue University in Calumet, excuse me. With Wes stepping down as, chair, as a Betts chair, with Dick Spies leaving Drexel and therefore stepping down as Betts chairs, there were a second round of new chairs. I became the Betts chair in 1991, Jim Spatilla on the left, who was a professor in biology, became Betts chair in 1990. ESI, Environmental Studies Institute, because of the difficulties with the Breslin administration, enrollment was decreasing. I think it's safe to say, in historical hindsight, finances were mismanaged, and a host of other issues it became much more difficult for faculty who, remember, were really appointed in their home departments to devote time to an institute. And ESI was not the only one. There was also the Biomedical Institute at the time as well because, what's the saying, a man cannot serve two masters? And, and probably you can when resources are slack, but during tough times, it really becomes impossible. And so ESI was in the position of having to teach courses, having to offer degrees, and relying on the goodwill of stressed departments to allow their faculty to devote, devote time teaching and advising students to this institute. And therefore, when Constine Papadakis came in, we, and I was part of the group that made the proposal, made a proposal to the president for reorganization of the institutes. And therefore, in 1997, the School of Environmental Science, Engineering, and Policy, CSEP, was created. And faculty now were actually officially appointed in CSEP, rather than their home department. So I had been a faculty member in engineering, technically. And in fact, I'll give you a, a quick, quick anecdote. I remember to this day, and I've talked to Rich Wagle about this. When I interviewed here at Drexel, I spent almost all my time talking to ESI faculty. And then at the end of one dinner, you know, Rich sort of asked me as we were walking back to the hotel, you wouldn't mind having your tenure in civil engineering, would you? That was the first inkling I had of this diff difficult arrangement that existed. So the creation of CSEP allowed faculty to actually formally be part of a structure that was advising students, teaching courses, and offering degrees. Mike Elt, who was director of ESI, became director of the school. Faculty were consolidated into Nesbitt Hall. The Abbott's building was torn down. 
New faculty were hired. I think we wound up hiring five or six faculty during the CSEP period, only one of whom in the upper right I've shown as a photo, Robert Brule, who remains at Drexel to this day uh, in sociology. <clears throat> We developed new BS programs in environmental engineering and environmental science, and new masters and PhD programs in environmental policy. The BS programs persist. The masters and PhD programs persist to this day. Now, now I was telling, I telling uh, uh, Professor Greenberg earlier. You know, Time Time Magazine has Person of the Year, and their caption is "Person for Good or Evil." So this is a person for evil. A former provost, Harville Eaton, probably did, at least during the time I've been at Drexel, the single greatest damage of any administrator that I've seen in my career. Harville decided after Mike Gelt left and we went through the process of trying to find a replacement in Sue Killam, who's in biology, or excuse me, now in the bees department, um, served as interim for a couple of years. Harville decided unilaterally to disband CSEP in 2002 and move its programs to individual colleges. The reason for his decision to this day, in my mind, remains cryptic. And I've talked to a number of people, and you know, I don't get a coherent story as to why it occurred. This resulted in departures of all the new faculty that we had hired, except for Bob Rule. It resulted in departure of other faculty who were part of ESI than CSEP. And also we had faculty, particularly in the Ear Resources program, who were nearing retirement, and at that point they took retirement, and voila, there was no longer an air pollution effort at Drexel. Now recall to the very beginning of my talk, really the earliest expertise in the environmental area at Drexel was in air, both Thornthwaite and Walpurnum. So we no longer had that capability. So in 2002, <clears throat> Abbott's building had been closed with the disbandment of Nesbitt, where the CSEP faculty were housed as a unit. The faculty were dispersed to individual colleges and into individual departments and laboratories. And essentially, we've never replaced those resources. Now they've gone. They've gone to good use, I've got to, got to say, and Professor Clausen is in the room, so I'll say it with her here. My laboratory was in Nesbitt, which has now been converted to good use as a laboratory that the public health school uses. So I'm delighted to see that. But, you know, we, there were resources on the science side, on the engineering side, that were never replaced. Now, one of the things, fortunately, that we've been able to do, and I say this on behalf of both Jim Spatilla, as well as myself, and I think Jim would agree with me, is by virtue of L.D. Betz's endowment and gift, we've been able to transcend the external forces that have been at our doorstep in a number of times. And I, I don't know if this is a, a, a transcendent lesson through the you know, entirety of Drexel Scott, but you know, the lesson that I've learned, at least in the environmental area, and from what I've seen elsewhere at Drexel, is very often you know, a, a, a strong and determined faculty can help buffet whatever predilections may exist at upper levels from time to time. Now, in essence, in two, since 2002, we've had a lot of well, a new, a new equilibrium state reached that I think has had some degree of stability. It's a different one than we had the institutes. 
The engineering faculty are now in my department, Civil Architecture and Environmental Engineering. The environmental science faculty are now in the bees department. Environmental policy is somewhat more problematic. Um, there's yet to be a, a, a re-agglomeration of environmental policy in one coherent nucleus. The Bob, Bob Rule remains, and there are new hires, I think, principally in politics, um, as well as history. I don't know if you have, you have an environmental historian now, right? So in both history and politics, um, that take up the environmental policy mantle. Um, we've had the opportunity for a lot of new hires and a lot of new units. Dorn Seif was a big addition to Drexel. It was, I, I, I'd say, you know, having been through the, the merger, the acquisition of MCP Hahnemann, there was a lot of negativity on main campus and skepticism on main campus toward that. Um, I'm agnostic as to nursing and the medical school, but I was delighted to hear that a public health school came in. And, you know, I think this adds an important additional leg to the stool or leg to the table of the environmental offerings that we have. Going back to my Department of Domestic Science, issues of hygiene, issues of ventilation, now have a home. In environmental engineering, we've rebuilt an air pollution program. One of my air pollution colleagues is here now. Through partly by accident, partly by luck, but we've rebuilt it. In environmental science with the Academy of Natural Sciences, they've been able to, to increase the breadth and depth of expertise in the environmental science area. And the one that's probably still in embryonic form is the Lindy Institute. I think that has the opportunity to bring the element of environmental planning back to Drexel so that we have a broad spectrum of folks working in this space. Looking backward, I doubt that, that Francis Davis or Walt Purdom could have predicted where we are now. <clears throat> the study of the environment of cities is more firmly integrated into the matrix of Drexel than ever. You know, different universities, different universities have different cultures. I've been at universities where multidisciplinary institutes and centers work well, and there are some great examples of that. For whatever reason, we don't appear to be one. And actually, now that I think about that, let me, let me give you another anecdote. <clears throat> so I came in January 1991, and literally a year later, I asked for a meeting with President Breslin. And, you know, I got it. It was the only time I had a one-on-one -on -one with him. And I had come from institutions where there was a lot of cross-collaboration between faculty and linkages and so forth. And I wanted to tell him my observation that Drexel was very siloed. We've gotten a lot better in the last 25 years. But certainly at that time it was. And... The guy agreed with me. He thought about that. And you'll love this, Mark. He blamed his predecessors. So there's something in the DNA, which I think is being broken apart rapidly, that has limited the extent of collaboration that we really need, particularly given our footprint. You know, I, I did my PhD at a university whose campus was a square mile. Understandable that you wouldn't have a faculty member in engineering talking to a faculty member in, we had a department of veterinary public health at the time. You know, because we were literally at two ends of the campus. But, you know, my office is two blocks from Ann's and my office is, you know, across uh, the Pearlstein Commons from Arts and Sciences and so on and so forth. But, you know, we still, 
we still regard these, these barriers as um, you know, existing within the institution and between institutions. Um, so the history shows it's difficult for structures such as institutes to thrive, and the key is always committed faculty to withstand and adapt. Where do we go forward? Well, and actually I should have, should have changed my first line, we're entering a period where federal retrenchment in the environment is almost certain to occur. So there's a need to refocus on state and local and private opportunities. We have a lot of the pieces of Drexel to approach problems holistically. And I think we're able to if we overcome institutional barriers as they arise and beat them down. Support from the deans is important. And that support needs to be cultivated. And it provides a greater source of vulnerability particularly in financially stressed times. Energy sustainability nexus, next I, are rising, rising in importance. We now have the A.J. Drexel Institute for Energy and the Environment. Question is, can buildings that are being planned accommodate the needed laboratory and research expansions that we really need? And now Jim Spatilla and I are almost contemporaries, I think, within a year or two of each other. Um, you know, at some point, there'll be a third set of Betts chairs, and that will present opportunities as well as challenges. So I thought I'd just leave you with this quote, which is one thing that I love from Barry Commoner, um, who was one of the principal environmental thought leaders of the 20th century, and I think we have time for some questions. Thank you. Anyone, don't be shy. Mark? So, Chuck, in your view, would the university and the work that it does in teaching and research be better served if there were a central organization, an institute to which everyone would be attached? Or does it work better when it's more distributed? I, I think either model could work. Um, and I think there are examples of both models as other universities working successfully. I think the issue really is what do the incentives and whatever budget model we wind up converging to give to departments and units to allow their faculty to collaborate? Because multidisciplinary disciplinary collaboration can be killed either by an adverse budget model, or frankly also in individual colleges that have young faculty going up for promotion and tenure, saying, you're not really doing work in our areas, so you know, forget about it. And unfortunately, some of that attitude still exists in certain quarters here. I think I've killed it in my department, but you know, I know it exists elsewhere. And I am talking about RCM. Scott? I'm a nerdy historian question. Yep. Uh, because you're now an honorary nerdy historian. <laughs> um, but, you know, one of the challenges of doing institutional history, like the history of the university, um, is, and I think you take this head on, is to try to understand that you're constantly juggling multiple scales. You're dealing with Very yep. nicely sketch out here, which goes back to the 19th century. Right. It wasn't invented yeah. in the 1960s. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the context there is good. And then there's the context of the city and then the institution itself. And then, of course, once you pop the top off the institution, you find there's a lot of vitality and dynamism going on. People often sort of think, well, universities are these very staid organizational, stable places. But those of us, students and faculty and staff alike, know that's not true. So my question is, I wonder how much of this, particularly this period from the 70s into the early 2000s, of a lot of institutional change. So where are 
the experts who have these questions on their mind at Drexel, they're moving around, as you said, constantly. How much of that is a reflection of policy, policy instability in the nation or instability in the sort of broader profession of the environment, let's say? I mean, you know, what do you, can you tie those to external, external factors? I think you, you opened the conversation by yeah. saying pretty clearly from the 50s into the early 60s, the environment broadly becomes a federal policy concern. Yep. But then, you know, my reading of, of it is that we ping pong back and forth, both in the nation and in the state, as to whether or not the environment is a concern, or we don't think it's a concern and will dominate change. Why? I wonder if you could, again, just sort of correlate those two things, or is it not a correlation? It's just what was happening really internally to the dress. So... You know, at least as far as I can tell, with probably the exception of Walt Purdom, the local and state influences on the Drexel context don't appear to have been significant. Um, and, you know, amongst states, as far as I can tell, Pennsylvania has re never really had a reputation as being a leader in environmental protection, environmental control. So locally, I think the drivers have been federal. And if I look at the faculty, even at the outset, and there's some very good records of what faculty were present at the outset of the IEES and what research they were doing. They were doing research that was really driven by federal and to some degree regional contexts. So there was work going on on why were there taste and, tastes and odors in the Delaware? And why was the oxygen disappearing in the Delaware? And issues of air pollution control from industry. So, you know, topics that remain relevant today. So I think the drivers, at least here, from the beginning, were federal. Um, you know, the thing I don't have a good enough handle on because I really, the period before, before the 40s, I think I haven't plumbed as deeply as I could have. Um, I'm sure there were some connections between Drexel and the city especially, but I haven't been able to locate records on that. Um, you know, in, the, in that Department of Domestic Science, there must have been connections going on with, with planning and with the health department, I surmise. But what they were, I don't know. Is it also a reflection of the variability of the job market? Because some of the departments here at Drexel were stable over long periods of time, and I think that reflects the stability of the yeah. economies. But I wonder, environment, again, is a multifaceted area. No, well, I think, and I think that's right. And at least until probably the 90s, it was, you know, science and engineering that was really almost the exclusive purview of employment. It certainly broadened a lot since then. Yeah. No, I mean, I think, I think it's, it's, it's too early to tell, and I'll tell you why. You know, getting back to my comment about, in the end, it all depends on people. Um, you know, so at this point, with Joe Hughes stepping out of the deanship and going into IEXE, um, it really depends on his longevity of being able to, you know, make that a strong going concern or not. And so I don't think, you know, we know the answer yet. You know, probably historians would say history is not journalism. So I think IEXE is still at the journalism phase. With that, I think we'll conclude and thank you.
Thank you.